welcome you all to another session from beyond loss clc team on a topic of master class on the court fees and suit valuation act as discussed with the resource person uh, subramaniam srivastava a, a senior advocate from karnataka high court at the first outset i would say that since the pronunciation could be slightly different what i thought to him we would be having four sessions on this se uh, topic of court fees and suit valuation act two parts will be conducted in the month of december and two will be spilled over in the month of january since the topic is vast and the resource person is good taking into consideration that it is a vital part especially once you are practicing on the trial side we had decided that the master classes should be divided into four parts and without taking much time uh, i would request mr subramaniam who is a well known speaker plus a lawyer with immense knowledge and he is also writing a book on this consequently taking into the consideration the subject and the resource person we requested him and as usual the speakers have been kind enough to accede to our requests uh, over to you sir thank you beyond law clc thank you vikas for giving me an opportunity as you rightly said the subject is vast however i'll try to give you some history some comments and cover all the important aspects of court fee and suits valuation in the course of my anticipated four lectures as you rightly said court trial lawyers i have also been before for 32 years i was practicing extensively in the trial courts and i know the importance subject is dry but it's interesting so let's start the subject of court fee payable in any court except the supreme court falls under entry 3 of list 2 state list of the seven schedule to the constitution court fee payable in the supreme court falls under entry 77 of list 1 that is the union list as court fee is payable in any court except the supreme court falls under the state list 10 states i think now it's 11 with telangana added have already repealed the court fees act 1870 in its application to their respective states and have enacted their own court fee legislations most of the other states who have not who don't have a court fees act have also amended the court fees act 1870 as applicable to those states the union territory of pondicherry now known as puducherry has enacted a separate court fees act parliament can make law only for union territories and the supreme court on the subject of court fee the supreme court has made rules in this bihar so what is this court fee court fee is a fee that is imposed on a litigant to contest a case in a court of law we are talking only of civil litigation this fee is levied by the government on the people seeking judicial remedies through a legislation this concept of court fee was introduced in india by the british during the colonial rule now the court fees act 1870 consists of 36 sections in six chapters section 7 deals with computation of court fees payable on certain suits section 8 is the computation of fee on the memoranda of appeal against orders relating to compensation 9 to 11 deal with profit and accounting well deals with valuation of relief in suits or appeals for collection of court fees 13 to 15 deal with refund of fees for review and for remand of appeal 17 deals with multifarious suits 30 deals with cancellation of stamps received by the court by punching out the figure head so as to leave the amount designated on the stamp untouched but since the i will call it the central court fees act of 1870 was found to be defective unscientific and no way exhaustive and as administration of justice is allocated as one of the main functions of the state 
the state not only has to maintain a system of administration of justice for the maintenance of law and order, but it also has to provide a system to enable its citizens to canvass their rights against wrongs done to them, as well as the state itself. 10 states, now 11 with Telangana, have either amended the provisions or enacted their own court fees acts. In every suit or proceeding, there is a subject matter. The subject matter, the suit of proceeding could be immovable property, movable property, or just cash, or the subject matter can be as intangible as rights. Now, every subject matter in every suit or other proceeding has a value. Some can be determined, some cannot. A valuation has to be made of the subject matter. The court fees and suits valuation acts across the country tell us how a given subject matter, but what is the court fee payable on that subject matter? The court fees acts connect the relief a person has sought in a particular suit or other proceeding with the value of the subject matter and require payment of a fee, which is considered to be the cost for the state assisting the parties to resolve the dispute. The court fees acts across the country have different kinds of values. There is the market value, there is the statutory value, there is a notional value, and there is also the concept of fixed court fee, irrespective of value. For example, in Karnataka, when I apply for probate, irrespective if the estate exceeds a certain figure, then irrespective of the figure, 100 crores, 200 crores, the court fee payable is only 39,000, fixed. Doesn't make a difference. That has been a change from the past. These concepts appear in all court fee legislations across the country in one form or the other. The only difference is the amount of court fee payable. Court fee being a state subject, the court fees payable for any given kind of case varies from state to state or union territory. We have to start somewhere. Let's start with market value. Market value is the value that a property will fetch in the open market under the state of things prevailing on the date of the plague. If we take a land with trees on it, the value must include the value of the trees. But if this land is Rayatwari land, where the court fee legislation provides for calculation of market value as a multiple of the revenue, then the trees need not be taken into account. So also in the case of lands with wells, where the land as a whole is being valued, the wells need not be separately valued. The Allahabad High Court in Srimati Kamala Devi versus the Sunni Central Board of Wakfs reported in AIR 1949 Allahabad page 63 held that market value is the value the property would fetch in the open market irrespective of any limitation to which it may be subject and regardless of any consideration such as litigation attaching to it. In the case of a land subject to mortgage, the value of the land and not merely the equity of redemption is, it, is the value for the purpose of the suit. This view was taken in Shivnarayan versus Ram Kelavan, reported in AR 1945 out 135. Now, the Madras High Court in Farooq Kamath versus Muhammad Hanif and another reported in 1963, Volume 2, Madras Law Journal, page 59, held that estimates of mean profits may be inaccurate or exaggerated, and that cannot be the basis upon a formula of capitalization to determine the value unless no other method is available. Now, the motor and pump set attached to a land cannot be required to be valued separately. 
if the motor and pump set is embedded on the earth and attached for the beneficial enjoyment of that to which it is attached. Now, if I have land and there there's a motor and pump set, it's attached to draw water for the benefit of the land, the valuation of the land would include the value of the machinery. This was the view taken by the Madras High Court in PL Supramanya Chetiar versus PL reported in AR 1974 Madras 8.5. Now, when considering the tank bed land, the Madras High Court held that the tank bed land has no market value as forming part of a land used for irrigating other lands. This view can be found in Manikyam Pillai versus Nagaswami Iyer, reported in AR 1934 Madras 714. Now, when we go to section seven of the Court Fees Act of 1870, we find the use of the, the word house. Now, this has been held to be used in an extensive sense, so as to include buildings which may not be used for residential purposes. The word house does not mean a place where people live. It could be a factory. Thus, it was held that an indigo factory, for example, could fall within the ambit of house used in section seven of the court fees. Now we have statute to UI. Many states, I'm not very sure if all the states have followed it, in respect of land paying land revenue, court fee legislations provide that the value of the land will be a multiple of the land revenue being paid for the same. This is a legal fiction regarding the market value of the lands that form an entire estate or a definite share of the estate. This method of valuation in respect of lands paying land revenue is a concession. If you look at it from a very different point of view, you'll realize that when a farmer grows his crops, the government has a minimum support price. They pay only for the crops. They don't pay for the land. So with the result, farmers and people doing agriculture are given this concession in the matter of valuation for determining the market value. Then we have something known as notional value. Notional value is just a figure. In cases for bare injunction, where I file a suit for bare injunction, in the Karnataka, for example, the value of such a suit is fixed at 1,000 rupees, and court fee of 25 rupees is required to be paid. This is for the reason that what is sought to be enforced is an intangible right for which there can be no market value. Now, this is aside. Now, coming back to the history of court fee legislations in the country, Andhra Pradesh, the Andhra area, as it originally was, was under the composite state of Madras. In fact, a part of Karnataka also, Bangalore also was under the Madras presidency. The Madras government amended the Central Court Fees Act in 1922 and also the Suits Valuation Act of 1887. For the state of Hyderabad, originally under Nizam rule, there was a Court Fee Act of 1324 firstly. 1324 firstly, whenever you hear the word firstly, add 589 and you come to the current AD date. So when I say 1324 firstly, it means 1923 AD. That is the calendar which we use. Now, after separation of Andhra area from the composite state of Madras, the Andhra Pradesh Court Fees and Suits Valuation Act was enacted in 1956 with effect from 1st uh, of May. Subsequently, the act was extended to the erstwhile Hyderabad state. 
This continued till the formation of Telangana state. Now, both states of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana have separate enactments for court fees and suits violations. Karnataka introduced the Karnataka Court Fees and Suits Valuation Act in 1958. As a matter of interest, the Court Fees Acts of Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka are very similar and one can be used to understand the other. In fact, the principles and the words and the concepts used in all court fee legislation being more or less the same we can draw a wealth of information from other states also in form of decisions to explain or try to explain what a particular word or a phrase means. Now it is in uh, 1999, the Department of Justice had examined the detail, examined in detail the proposal to amend the Court Fees Act of 1870. This was in pursuance of the recommendations of the expert group appointed by the Ministry of Home Affairs. However, the Department of Justice, with the approval of then Minister of Law, decided not to amend the Act, especially in view of the provisions of the Devolution Act 1920, which empowers states to amend the Court Fees Act 1870. The Devolution Act has been repealed in 1938, but because of this, the Court Fees Act can be amended by the states and therefore it was found not necessary for the center to amend the Court Fees Act. As far as court fees payable in other courts exercising jurisdiction over the union territories is concerned, no doubt parliament can enact any law by virtue of the power conferred on it by Article 246, 4 of the Constitution. Now, apart from Article 246, 4 of the Constitution, the President of India may also, under Article 240 of the Constitution, make regulations for the peace, progress, and good governments of the Union territories of Andaman and Nicobar, Lakshadweep, Dadra Nagarhaveli, Daman Diu, and Pondicherry. I think we can possibly add, or maybe I don't know, add Ladakh. However, for the Union territory of Pondicherry, any regulation can only be made by the President when the Legislative Assembly of the Union territory of Pondicherry is dissolved or is under suspension. At present, there are only seven territories having status of union territory. These are Delhi, Andaman and Nicobar Islands, Lakshadweep, Dadra, Nagar Haveli, Daman and Diu, Pondicherry, and Chandigarh. Amongst these seven union territories, Delhi and Pondicherry are having their own legislative assemblies also. These legislative assemblies can also enact any law on a subject following in list two, that is the state list, the seventh schedule to the constitution. For Delhi, you could see subclause A of clause three of Article 239AA of the Constitution of India. For Pondicherry, you can see section 18 of the Government of Union Territories Act 1963. However, the Parliament's power under Article 246.4 is unaffected. And any law made by Parliament will prevail or any law made by the Legislative Assembly mentioned above. For this, you can see subclauses B and C of subclause 3 of Article 239A of the Constitution of India and sections 18, subsection 2 and 21 of the Government of Union Territories Act, 1963. In fact, the Pondicherry Legislative Assembly has already enacted the Pondicherry Court Fees and Suits Valuation Act in 1972. States, there are a list of states which have repealed the Court Fees Act 1870 in their territories and enacted their own 
court fees acts. One, Andhra Pradesh, they have the Andhra Pradesh court fees and suits valuation act 1956. Gujarat, and you have Himachal Pradesh, Himachal Pradesh court fees act 1968. <coughs> Jammu and Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir court fees act 1977. Karnataka, Karnataka court fees and suits valuation act 1958. Kerala, Kerala Court Fees and Suits Valuation Act 1960, Maharashtra Bombay Court Fees Act 1959, Rajasthan Rajasthan Court Fees and Suits Valuation Act 1961, Tamil Nadu 1955, West Bengal 1970, the Union Territory of Pondicherry 1972. Apart from this, some states have amended the provisions of the Court Fees Act 1870 from time to time as applicable in those respective states. They are Assam, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Orissa, Punjab, Haryana, Meghalaya, Uttar Pradesh, Manipur and Tripura. Manipur and Tripura were formerly Union Territories. As per Section 2 of the Union Territories Laws Act 1950, the central government is empowered to extend to Union Territories of Delhi, Himachal Pradesh, Nava State, Manipur, Nava State, and Tripura, Nava State, any enactment which was in force in that state. In exercise of this power, the Court Fees Act of 1870, as in force in the state of Assam, was extended to Manipur and Tripura. Manipur and Tripura have now become states by the Northeastern Areas Reorganization Act 1971. Now, Goa. The territory of Goa is formerly part of the Union Territory of Goa, Daman, and Diu. By Regulation 11 of 1963, with effect from 3rd September 1964, Court Fees Act 1870 has been extended to Goa, Daman, and Diu. This act was further amended in 1970. Now, Goa has become a state by the Goa, Daman, and Diu Reorganization Act 87. Arunachal Pradesh, Mizoram, and Nagaland. The territories of all these states were formerly part of the Assam state. The Court Fees Act 1870 is applicable in the state of Assam, continues to be enforced in these states. Nagaland was made a state by the State of Nagaland Act 1962. As per Section 26 of the said Act, all laws which were enforced in the territory of Nagaland are continued to be enforced. Mizoram and Arunachal Pradesh were made separate union territories by Section 6 and 7 of the Northeastern Area Reorganization Act 1971. Here again, as per Section 77 of the said Act of 1971, all laws which were in force in these territories are continued to be in force. Arunachal Pradesh was made a state by the State of Arunachal Pradesh Act 1986. As per Section 46 of the Act, all laws which were in force in the territory continued to be in force. Mizoram was made a state in 1986 as per the State of Mizoram Act 1986, and Section 43 of this Act also provides similar. Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, and Uttaranchal. These states were formerly parts of Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, and Uttar Pradesh, respectively. The Court Fees Act 1870 is applicable in these states before the reorganization in the year 2000. It still continued to be enforced by virtue of Section 84 of the Bihar Reorganization Act, Section 86 of the UP Reorganization Act, and 78 of the MP Reorganization Act. Now we come to Sikkim. By the 36th Amendment to the Constitution in 1975, the territory of Sikkim was included in the territory of India and made a state. As per Article 371F of the Constitution, the High Court and other courts situated in Sikkim continued to be in existence. You can see Clause I 
and J of Article 371F. Similarly, all laws which were in force at that time in Sikkim were declared to be continued in force. Now, Court Fees Act 1870 is applicable in union territories, Delhi. The Court Fees Act 1870 as amended has been extended to Delhi with effect from 1 8 1959. It was further amended by the Court Fees Delhi Amendment Act 1967. Chandigarh, the territory of Chandigarh, formerly part of the Punjab state, it became a separate union territory and all in 1966. Andaman and Nicobar Islands, it was a chief commissioner's province under the Government of India Act 1935. Formerly, it was shown as a part D state in the Constitution of India and is now in union territory. The Court Fees Act of 1870 was extended to the new provinces by Section 3 Redwoods, the schedule to the Merge States Laws Act 1941. For the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, the Court Fees Act 1870 has been amended by the Court Fees Andaman and Nicobar Islands Amendment Regulation 1957. Dadra Nagarhaveli, the territory of the free Dadra Nagarhaveli was made a union territory by the Constitution 10th Amendment Act 1961 and the Court Fees Act of 1870 was extended. Daman and Diu, 1870 was extended in 1963 and amended again in 1966 and 70. Lakshadweep, it was part of the former Madras state. It was made a union territory by the state's reorganization act 1956. The old name was Lakadiv, Minikoi, and Amindiv Islands. It became Lakshadiv by the Lakadiv, Minikoi, and Amindiv Islands Alteration of Names Act 1973. Court Fees Act 1870 has been extended to this act. Pondicherry also. As I've already told you, the Legislative Assembly of Pondicherry has enacted Pondicherry Court Fees and Suits Violence Act in 1970. The 1870 Court Fees Act, which is applicable in Pondicherry, has since been repealed. Now, all of you have heard a lot of uh, history. Let me give you a bit of trivial information. There is empirical evidence that the judiciary earns more than it spends. There was a study of the budgets and working of the Supreme Court and the Allahabad High Court in 1984. This study revealed some interesting facts. Dr. Rajiv Dhawan had prepared a report called Litigation Explosion in India. It was published by the Indian Law Institute and showed that the figures for the year 1957 to 77 indicated that the Supreme Court invariably spent less than the sum it received under the head grant allocated and other receipts. The amount collected as court fee virtually remained unspent. As regards the judiciary in Uttar Pradesh, including the Allahabad High Court for the figures 1961-62 to 1978-79, showed that the income earned by the courts from judicial stamps and fees on writs, vakalatnama, etc. was always in excess of what was spent on them, thus leaving a Substantial surplus in each other. Dr. Dawan, in his report, comments The judiciary is India's best nationalized industry. As a whole, it earns more than it spends. In that sense, it can also be described as the least expensive branch. That was just a bit of information which I read somewhere, thought it may interest you. Now we come back to the Central Court Fees Act. As I said, divided into seven chapters. Chapter one comprises sections one and two as preliminary. Chapter two covers three sections, three to five, which deals with fees of high court and court of small causes at presidency towns. Chapter three covers section six to 19, which deals with fees of other courts and public offices. Few sections are also applicable for the High Court. Chapter 3A of the Act, comprising 19A to 19K, deals with probates and letters of administration. 
Chapter 4 deals with process fees. Chapter 5 with the mode of levying the fee. And chapter 6 is miscellaneous. Apart from these chapters, the Court Fees Act 1870 consists of two schedules. Schedule 1 and 2 give ex extensive arrangement, various kinds of suits regarding the subject matter relief claim, along with the table of fees payable. Schedules also provide that fees payable on certain documents shall vary according to the court in which they are filed. Section 6 of the Act provides that except in the courts mentioned, no document of any kind specified as chargeable in the first or second schedule to this Act annexed shall be filed, exhibited, or recorded in any court of justice or shall be received or furnished by any public officer unless in respect of such document there be paid a fee of an amount not less than that indicated by either of the said schedules as the proper fee for such document. This section relates to courts other than those specified in section 4 and to public offices and makes a provision that is similar to section 4 for such courts and public offices. It precludes courts and offices to collect or provide any document unless it has been properly stamped. This section urges the courts to see whether a document presented before it is sufficiently stamped. By this section, the court can question the sufficiency or otherwise of the court fee by looking into the allegations made in the plate. If a substantive relief is claimed, though clothed in the garb of a declaratory decree with a consequential relief, the court is entitled to see what is the real nature of the relief. And if it is satisfied that it is not a mere consequential relief, but a substantive relief, it can request proper court fee on that relief, irrespective of the arbitrary valuation that may have been put on it by the plaintiff on the ostensible consequential relief. There is one case which may be of some use. Raghunath Ganesh versus Vaman Vasudev reported in AR 1950 Bombay 234. AR 1950 Bombay 234. In this case, the Bombay High Court held that Section 4 should be read along with Section 28, that this section does not control the application of Section 149 of the Civil Procedure Code. If any conflict arises between Sections 4 and Section 6 of the Court Fees Act and Section 149 of the CPC, <clears throat> then it can be resolved by Section 8 of the Court Fees Act. When an insufficiently stamped memorandum of appeal comes before the court, it deals with the ambit of Section 28 of the Court Fees Act and Section 149 of the Civil Procedure Code. It depends on the court, reject or simply return, refuse the request. In either case, the appellant is entitled to present a fresh memorandum of appeal on sufficient court fee. Section 7 of the Act. Section 7 of the Act states the various processes by which fees in different lawsuits are to be determined. This section purports to deal with the method of computation of court fees payable on different lawsuits mentioned in the clauses. <clears throat> Section 7 contemplates three modes of valuation of the subject matter. One, valuation depends upon the actual value of the subject matter that determines the amount of court fee to be paid. Two, artificial value based on the fixed rules of calculation. Three, notional value, valuation at the option of the plaintiff. The plaintiff himself will value the court fee payable by him based on the relief he is seeking. Schedules 1 and 2 venture to provide a complete classification of different kinds of suits. The schedule states that proper court fee shall vary according to the courts in which the case is filed, depending upon some documents. 
There might be no changes in court fee regarding some documents. Schedule one applies to that court fee which are payable either on the plaint or memorandum of appeal. In Schedule 2, it is mentioned that the plaints and appeals in a lawsuit shall bear all the fixed fees prescribed in the table. Now, section 4 and Section 6 of the statement that the plaint has to be stamped with the court fee either under Schedule 1 or Schedule 2. The two schedules classify lawsuits into different groups, either by Schedule 1's ad valorem fee or by Schedule 2's fixed fee. Section 13 of the Court Fees Act 1870 states that if an appeal which is rejected by the lower court or on any of the grounds mentioned in the Code of Civil Procedure, or if a suit is remanded in appeal on any of the grounds mentioned, the appellate court has to grant a certificate to the appellant authorizing him to collect the full amount of fee paid for the memorandum of appeal from the collector. Section 15 of the Act states that when in a case an application is considered for the review of the judgment and the court modifies its former judgment on the grounds of mistake of the law or mistake of fact, then the applicant is entitled to receive from the court a certificate authorizing him to collect the amount of fee paid on the application under the second schedule. Sections 25 to 27 deal with the mode of collecting fees. As per section 25, all fees mentioned under section three of this act shall be collected by stamps. Section 26 provides that stamps should be partly, partly adhesive and partly impressed as per the government. Section 27 says that the appropriate government may from time to time make rules regulating the supply of stamps to be used, the number of stamps to be used for denoting any fee, the renewal of damaged or spoiled stamps, keeping of accounts. Now, as per the amendment to the Code of Civil Procedure in 1999 by Chapter 6, Section 34, in the Central Court Fees Act 1870, Section 16 for refund of court fees, was introduced, consequent to a new section 89, CTC. Section 16 of the amended act says that where the court refers the parties to the suit to any one of the modes of settlement of disputes referred to in section 89, arbitration, conciliation, judicial settlement, including settlement through lok adalat or mediation, the plaintiff will be entitled to a certificate from the court authorizing him to receive back from the collector the full amount of the court fees paid in respect of such a plea. Now, we will go into some philosophical, possibly called philosophical aspects. What is the nature of court fee? And what is its justification? There are a few questions which I'll try to answer. Is court fee a fee or a tax? Can access to justice be for a price? Does the issue of court fee require a different treatment in the context of administration of criminal justice? Does the collection of court fee impede civil justice? Is it fair on the part of the court to charge court fee? Is there a need for governments to provide more money for the better administration of justice? Now, the Court Fees Act is a fiscal enactment. Its primary objective is to shield or protect the revenue of the state. It was passed to secure the revenue for the benefit of the state. Court fee is considered as a state debt. The government has an obligation to pay court fees as much as any other party who approaches a court of law. This act also determines the jurisdiction of the courts. It's not mandatory for the court fee valuation and the jurisdictional value to be the same. The right procedure is to ascertain the value for court fees and then adopt the same value for jurisdiction. It is permissible. Now, 
levies can be divided into two major categories, fees and taxes. D. Marco in his uh, book, First Principles of Public Finance, at page 78 has said that a fee is a charge for a particular service of special benefit to individuals or to a class and of general benefit to the public, or it is a charge to meet the cost of regulation that primarily benefits society. In Central Coal Fields Limited versus Jaiswal Coal Company, reported in AR 1980 Supreme Court, 2125, the Supreme Court through Justice Krishna here said, that the effective access to justice is one of the basic requirements of a system and a high amount of court fee may amount to sale of justice. The right to effective access to justice has emerged as the first among new social rights as seen by the proliferation of public interest litigations, community-based actions and pro bono public proceedings. Effective access to justice is the basic requirement of a system which guarantees legal rights. As M. N. Vimta Chalaya, as he then was, and who went on to become the Chief Justice of India, said in PM Aswath Narayan Dasetti was the state of Karnataka, reported in 1989 Supplement, first volume, SCC 696, that a person who lodges a police complaint is not expected to pay for the services of the police, depending on whether the monetary value of the complaint is big or small. So also in the case of the justice delivery system, the state is not supposed to collect a fee depending on the nature of the subject matter in dispute. Later, the Supreme Court in Secretary to Government of India, Mrs. P.R. Sriramulu reported in 1996, Volume 1, SCC 345, that the administration of justice is a service which the state is under an obligation to render to its subjects. The Law Commission, shall I go back, 1996, 1 SCC, 345. The Law Commission in its 14th report on reform of judicial administration, old one, 1958, notices that court fee is a limitation and a deterrent to access to justice. And if access to the court is dependent on the payment of court fee, and if a person is unable to pay court fee, justice becomes unequal. The Law Commission in its 114th report on Gram and Nyayalaya, 1986, said that it was a fundamental duty of every government to provide a mechanism for resolution of disputes. The preamble to our constitution as well as Article 38 mandate that the state shall secure and protect as effectively as it may a social order in which justice is available to all its citizens. Article 39 capital A was introduced into the constitution by the 42nd amendment. Also to be read are Article 8 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights 1948 and Article 2.3 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Now we come to criminal justice. The Law Commission in its 127th report discussed the distinction between civil and criminal justice. The Law Commission said that the distinguishing feature between civil justice system and the criminal justice system lies in the fact that the civil justice system provides for a resolution of disputes between individuals and the state and even between states. On the other hand, the criminal justice system partakes the character of a regulatory mechanism of the society whereby the state enforces discipline in the society for investigation of crime and punishment. Thus the obligations of the state in respect of the administration of civil and criminal justice differ very materially. In its 128th report, the Law Commission said that the administration of criminal justice is the obligatory duty of the state 
as part of its sovereign functions and no fee can be levied for performing the same. And also because the system does not render service to any litigant. We now come to the last point where the collection of court fee impedes the access to justice. The Law Commission in its 128th report has observed that when it comes to civil justice, the current approach has to undergo a change. The Supreme Court has said that while court fee can be collected for purpose of civil justice, there is no obligation on the part of the state to collect such a fee and that general public revenues can be used to meet either in whole or in part the expenses of the administration of civil justice. Next, we come to the types of court. There are two kinds of court fees under the court fees. One, Ad valorem court fees, schedule one. It means according to the valuation. Ad valorem duties are always estimated at a certain percent on the valuation of the property as opposed to fixed or specific duties. Fixed or specific duties is the second type, it comes under schedule two. Now, computation of court fees. Section seven contemplates three types of valuation by valuing it according to its market value, by ascribing to the subject matter an artificial value based on certain fixed rules of calculation, by requiring the plaintiff to himself value the relief. Now this section applies only where ad valorem fee is paid. Now under section seven, how is court fee computed? In suits for money, Court fee is computed according to the amount claimed. In suits for maintenance or annuities or other sums payable periodically, 10 times the amount claimed to be payable in a year. In suits for movable property, where the subject matter has a market value, according to the market value on the date the plaint is presented. Suit for possession of land, buildings, or gardens according to the market value or net profit into 15 times, whichever is higher. Suits for preemption, if instituted under Muslim personal law, then according to the market value of the property. Suits for partition, according to the market value of the share in respect of which the suit has been instituted. As a matter of interest in Karnataka, in a suit for partition, where there is an government in the plaint, that the plaintiff is in joint possession, there is a fixed court fee of rupees 200, irrespective of the market value of the properties. Now, suit for the interest of an assignee of land revenue, 15 times the net profit. Suits to set aside an attachment of land, according to the amount for which the land was attached. Suits to redeem mortgage and suit for foreclosing according to the principal value. Suits for injunction or for a right to some benefit arising land. In such case, the plaintiff shall state the amount at which he values the suit. Now, again, I'm being from Karnataka. In Karnataka, when you file a suit for a thing, instead of the plaintiff fixing a value, it is said 1,000 rupees, court fee of 25. Now, section 35 of the Court Fees Act of 1870 says, the appropriate government may, from time to time, by notification in the official gazette, reduce or remit in whole or in part, any, in any whole or in part of the territories under its administration, all or any of the fees mentioned in the first and second schedule to this act, the appropriate government may from time to time by notification in the official gazette reduce or remit the fees. This section states that the appropriate government, whether the central government or the respective state governments, from time to time have the authority to reduce or remit the fees mentioned in the first and second sheet. And also having, after having remitted or reduced, it can also have the power to cancel such an order. Now, 
this continuous theory possibly get boring. So let me see a few under section seven. Rendered in states in which the Court Fees Act 1970 is still in force. In uh, state of Nagaland versus and others versus Dr. Mechu, Mechumla Anar reported in 2017 to Gauhati Law Report 614. 2017 to Gauhati Law Reports 614. The concept of consequential relief was considered and the court referring to the law lexicon held that the words relief sought in section 7.4 of the Court Fees Act 1870 does not refer to the consequential relief only, but that they may mean the relief sought as a whole. The next judgment in Gomati Prasad and another versus Mahesh Singh, reported in 2017, volume three, Madhya Pradesh Law Journal 2020. 2017, three Madhya Pradesh Law Journal 2020. It was held that the true test to ascertain whether the consequential relief in fact flows from the declaratory relief is as to whether the said consequential relief can be claimed independently of declaration as a substantial relief or not. Every injunction in a suit for injunction would not flow from a declaration in case where the plaintiff is in possession of the property in his own rights and seeks a declaration. In such a case, section 7.4D would be applicable for valuing the relief of injunction. And Article 17 of Schedule 2 of the Act would provide the court fees for such a declaration, where the relief of permanent injunction can be treated as a substantial relief and not as a consequential relief. Section 4C of the Act will not be attracted. For those of you who are possibly interested academically, you may also see Sabina versus Muhammad Abdul Wasit. Sabina versus Muhammad Abdul Wasit reported in 1997, Volume 1, Madhya Pradesh Law Journal 554. The next judgment is Ashok Kumar Gehani versus Ramhit Agrawal and another reported in 2008, one Madhya Pradesh Law Journal 116. 2008, one Madhya Pradesh Law Journal 116. Parasram Fate versus Union Bank of India, reported in 2008, Volume 1, Madhya Pradesh Law Journal 117. 2008, Volume 1, Madhya Pradesh Law Journal 117. In Rampyari Devi versus Kashinath Saha, reported in 2015, SCC Online Partner. 10154 2015 SCC partner SCC online partner 10154 the court was considering section 79 of the court fees act and held that it provided that in suits against a mortgagee for recovery of the property mortgage the court fee should be payable according to the principal money expressed to be secured by the instrument and the situation would not change where the defendant made a counterclaim for a decree of redemption. In Kapoor, alias Kapoor Chand Jain versus Anandita Sahe, Sahe, reported in 2018, SCC Online, Jharkhand, 1607. 2018, SCC Online, Jharkhand, 1607. The court considered section 711 CC and held that as no relief of arrears of rent was sought, the suit valuation on the basis of one year's rent was correct. In Ram Gya Singh versus Ram Nivas Singh, reported in 2019 SCC online Madhya Pradesh 4947. 2019 SCC Online, Madhya Pradesh 4947. The court considered Section 7.5 of the Act and also referred to Chotu versus 
Mula, reported in 2008 RN110 and held that though the suit was initially filed for injunction and later amended for possession, no additional court fee was payable as the plaintiff was asking for relief of possession of land, access to land revenue, and had already paid higher court fee in accordance with seven of the act. In uh, Hans Raj versus Raghuveer Singh, reported in 2020 Supreme Court Online Delhi 26, 2020 Supreme Court Online Delhi 26, the court referring to Makan Singh versus Srimati Amarjit Bali, reported in volume 154, bracket 20, year 2008, Delhi Law Times, page 2011, held that where the tenant continues in occupation after he repudiates the title of the landlord, the lease comes to an end by operation of law because of the repudiation of the title and the landlord can file a suit for possession in a civil court and the valuation of such a suit has to be on the basis of the annual rent under section 711 CC of the Court Fees Act 1870. In West Bengal, which earlier followed the Court Fees Act with amendments, the same was repealed and replaced by the West Bengal Court Fees Act 1970. In Jitend Das and others versus Martyari Vivekananda Shikshale, and another reported in AR 2020 Calcutta 228. AR 2020 Calcutta 228. It was held that as Section 7.6b of the 1970 Act was the same as the corresponding provision in the amended 1870 Act as amended in West Bengal. They followed the decision of the division bench in Amritlal Chatterjee versus Hiralal Chatterjee reported in 70 Calcutta Weekly Notes 857, 70 CWN 857, a suit for recovery of possession from a licensee upon termination of his license was the same in Amritlal's case, and the market value of the suit property was not the only objective standard to fix and revise the court fee. These are a few judgments under Section 7. I will collate all this in my later lectures. Initially, just to give you an idea of how these things are working. Next, we go to section 12. The Supreme Court in Nemi Chand and another versus Edward Mills Company reported in AR 1953, Supreme Court, page 28, has dealt with AR 1953, Supreme Court, page 28, has dealt with sections 5 and 12 of the Court Fees Act and held so the scope of Section 12 was narrower than that of Section 5. Section 5 declares decisions on questions of court fee whenever they arise in the chartered high courts as final and makes the decision to pay court fee or the amount final. On the other hand, Section 12 makes a decision on every question relating to valuation for the purpose of determining the amount of any fee payable under Chapter 3 on a plaint or a memorandum of fee final. In this judgment, the Supreme Court laid down a principle of law. When two sections in the same act relating to the same subject matter have been drafted in different languages, it is not unreasonable to infer that they were enacted with a different intention and that in one case was to give finality to all decisions of the taxing officer or the judge and on the other, it was intended that only to give finality to questions of fact that are decided by a court of law and not to questions mm -hmm. of law. In the same judgment at para 11, it's an interesting judgment, the Supreme Court said that the expression valuation interpreted in the ordinary meaning of appraisement cannot be said to necessarily include within its ambit the question of category, which is a matter of law. The Punjab High Court in Basant Lal versus Baru and another, reported in volume 19, one, Punjab series 602, said that where a part of the subject matter of the suit is comprised in the appeal before the appellate court, deficit court fee only in respect of that part 
can be revealed and not in respect of the entire subject matter of the suit. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have been continuously speaking for about little more than an hour. So I will continue tomorrow. Then I will slowly start getting you into more and more specifics. So now we have completed more or less the kind of history which we have been seeing. I'll get into specifics and then completely analyze the whole situation and say how court fees acts in my last lecture, court fees act should be interpreted. How important judgments from various states, irrespective of what court fees act is available in those states, can apply to every other court fee legislation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh... Thank you, sir. Till the questions come, two, three questions we had gotten. How does one interpret explanation two to section 38 of the Court Fees Act and Suit Valuation Act? Does it mean that suit for cancellation ought to be valued as a suit for possession in the event conditions therein are satisfied? If you look at section 30. This is a reference to the Karnataka Court Fees Act only. Karnataka Court Fees Act, okay. Section 38 deals with cancellation of documents. So if you ask me Karnataka, I can respond. Karnataka, Karnataka. Karnataka. Karnataka 38 refers to cancellation of documents. If you read section 38, it says, I will ask someone if, uh, uh, okay. Someone can uh, add that uh, section. See, section 38 deals with suits for cancellation of decrees, etc., or other documents. So, what happens is when you ask for cancellation, the value stated in the document has to come there on the value of the subject matter of the suit. Now, in Karnataka, what happens? There is a market value, say, of one crore, but the government value is fixed at about 75 lakhs. Across the board, courts have said that the government value which is fixed for properties in specified locations will be the market value, irrespective of what may be the current supply demand position. That is how we have to interpret. I'll come to 2038 specifically later. I don't want to okay. preempt this. I'll come to that because later because somebody has asked a section no. 38 explanation too. We will I, have I, it will, I will make a note of it and come to it. There's no problem. And could you explain the concept of guidance value? When must the guidance value be factored in the context of suit valuation? The reason is that if you look at properties, ultimately willing buyer, willing seller is the price. Somebody may decide that this property has got sentimental value, it's worth a crore. Another person may say it's got only so many square feet, it's worth 25 lakhs. The guidance value by the government takes into account the locality in which it's situated, the age of the building, it's, whether it's got mosaic tiles, whether it's got uh, electricity, RCC roof, and says this is the price per square foot of, say, an apartment. It says this is the price per square foot of vacant land. And that becomes, if I, if I have to file a suit, I just go to the guidance value and see which area, what is it, fix the fee. The court will not raise any further objection on it. That becomes non-controversial determination of market value, which otherwise can go back and forth. Hmm. This is, so it is more like what we say uh, under the land acquisition, a developed land and a developing land. Why, why, why do we uh, evaluate? Yes, yes. Here the government does that job and says this is it. And we accept it. And because all, under the land acquisition, we say yes. that the other party would always say that it's, a, uh, it's not a developed land, but it's a developing land. Yes. Or it has a potentiality of the developing land rather than what is a potential land. The government will say the land is valued at one rupee. The man who owns the land is valued at 100 rupees. So here we come to this. And one more thing is, now, who would want to pay more court fee if the government guidance value it generally is about 25 to 30% or 40% lower than the actual market value? I have no objection to paying court fee on that value. I mean, that is, from a point of view of a practicing lawyer, why will I want to say, I can, no, if the guidance value is 50 lakhs, I can value my suit at 70 lakhs and pay court fee. But I don't think anybody will do that. 
but there are certain instances under the uh, debt recovery act when the property is sold or under the securitization no. act no 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 under the securitization of banks what they do is they take market value as 2 crores they have distressed sale value so they reduce it by about half and then they sell it that's no, but in, uh, like uh, in lot of cases what happens is that they have uh, they given it to an agency and once yes. the agency is given in the under the distressed sale the sale is much lower than the even the collector price yes and how do you uh, then whether you will have to fix the stamp in terms of the collector price or what you have bought it at the collector price uh, no. on the distress sale no no i can buy a property for 100 rupees but i have to pay stamp duty on the guidance value of that can the be, collector price yes i can buy it i can say that i'll buy a property from you for 100 rupees but the, the property is worth 3 crores according to the government i have to pay stamp duty on 3 crores In terms of article, article twenty-three of the Stamp Act. Yeah, I have to pay according to the. There can be two values. One is the actual sale value. One is the value for the purposes of stamp duty. The government says you can take less or pay less, but I am not going to be deprived of my money. In, ter in terms of which provision or in any uh, judicial precedent to that effect? Yes, yes. There are a lot of them. I'll come all to that. All one by one. I'll come because there are two questions. One is. there can be two valuations the other is question of valuation for purpose of court fee question of valuation for the purpose of jurisdiction they can be different sometimes both merge and become one i will get through to all because this lecture is subject is too i think yeah, i need yeah. to get some hold of it before i go further and uh, this is a uh, tomorrow you will take it you can see that relief of an annulment of a document sought by a non signatory to the document yes will be a suit for declaration or a cancellation could you just throw some light on uh, upon this because due to some clever drafting uh, the substantive relief of cancellation in the garb of declaratory relief has been i i will do that i will do that tomorrow i'll do that okay that should be no issue then there is a request uh, privately it says kindly deal with the karnataka court fees and stamp valuation act uh, more specifically no i don't mind doing that completely tomorrow there's no problem Point is, I'm doing court fees act. I thought I need to go around the country and at least see where yeah, what true. is there. Yeah, that's true. And before I come back to Karnataka and say that I'll do this, no, that could be a more specific because. But since we have a pan India audience, yes, yeah. So since, since uh, pan India order, order, I mean audience, it's very unfair to restrict myself to the Karnataka. Possibly it'll help Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, and Tamil Nadu, nothing else. Yeah, I'm just seeing on the Facebook if we have some questions. No, we don't have. Right. So. so uh thank you on behalf of all those participants who have watched us live on the facebook and on this platform tomorrow we will be having the part 2 of court fees and suit valuation act by mr subramaniam uh, uh, sirivastwa and uh, there's one request by vani uh, goda she wants to ask something please vani that says they call the parting shot or what uh, mahendra singh dhoni used to have a helicopter shot in the final six so yeah varying <laughs> uh, coming around good evening sir good evening uh, thanks for uh, giving wonderful lecture uh, it was very useful but uh, my request is on behalf of dj aspirant since we have exams in the next month uh, it will mm. be more uh, we are, uh, our exams is very particular about karnataka kfi uh, fund uh, sv act uh, Sir. You convince you convince Mr. Vikas that I should speak on Karnataka court fee tomorrow. I'll speak on Karnataka court fee tomorrow. Uh, it will be more yeah. helpful for the DJ aspirants on behalf of all the aspirants. I'm just requesting. I understand. You. I understand. I understand. I'll do that. Then I'll do. I'll restrict myself tomorrow to Karnataka. Then we'll go on to the third and fourth and cover the others. So what you do? Primarily you cover Karnataka, but still yes. we have this because if we do that, it will be very religions, uh, not religion, regional, regional. specific. And then we will not have uh, the audience as such. That's you exactly can cover right. around fifty percent of that part. Uh, we'll do. We'll because do. We'll uh, do. it's not that the only the uh, uh, superior judiciary only the people from Karnataka would be appearing. There are Other judicial aspirants pan India also. Yes, I'll do that. Thank you, Thank you so much. So they can have uh, everybody can have a whiff of that and uh, move in the direction in which they actually want to move around. Done. So uh, thank you, thank you, sir, and thank, thank you to you. all the participants. everyone stay safe stay blessed and tomorrow we will connect at 5 pm instead of 4 pm uh, thank you good night good night can i leave can i leave definitely sir thank you we will connect tomorrow yes
Uh, yeah. 